second of five of the 48 ways. And that is be'emo. If you want to live, you've got to learn to use the emo. Emo is awe. Now, have we ever felt awe? Sure, everybody's felt awe in his life. The most prevalent awe that people feel, I mean, that we can have sheer as a common experience, is standing under the sky, if you've been in a kibbutz or in the country, out in the mountains, and look at the expanse of stars. It's an awesome feeling. If you focus on the fact how far away they are, how small we are, know a little bit about astronomy, each one of them is a raging sun. What is man? And we feel awe. Awe descends on us. It's a significant feeling. How can we use it in a day-to-day living? So number one of doing it, of how to use it, is first you've got to recall it when you felt it. Every one of us has had the experience. You've got to remember that experience. I'll use some things to jog you. Anybody here has ever been in a hurricane? I remember once when I was in a hurricane out in, in Long Island. I saw a tree uprooted and walking down the street. And I was standing near a window with glass in it. And I said to myself, no, this isn't very smart. You know, <laughs> this is not very... But I was trans- and, and transported. I just I had to see. Everybody see an avalanche. Volcano, Carter descended on Mount Helena. He said, uh, you were there? Yeah, you saw it that day? It's awesome. I mean, wham, all those trees, ring, <laughs> you know? The power, right? But you got to feel it again. you got to reconstruct it. If you've been on an ocean with 50-foot waves yeah, in a storm, you know, and seeing those waves coming down, you know, crash, right? Awesome feeling. It's not fear. Terror can strike you, yeah? We're talking about a feeling of awe, the power of the elements. Perhaps for people who uh, haven't been through these uh, things, like uh, uh, maybe the first time you were up in a plane, you saw the uh, clouds going like, uh, you know, sheep, (laughs) right? Streams of clouds or the ground up on the Empire State Building and looking down at little figures strikes you as awe. Number two is that there is another aspect of awe. It's the quiet awe. And that can be after a storm, the leaves dripping from rain. You look out and you see a fresh snowfall and everything is covered with snow as far as you can see. It's got to be out in the country. It's not in New York City. Or <laughs> but the whole scenery transposed. Or the trees etched with ice. And that can be a babbling brook, a spring uh, walk through the forest and the dabbling of colors, or a baby laughing, or majestic music. It's a quiet awe, but it's the same essential feeling, the aesthetic experience where we're transported by the overwhelming beauty. That's the awe of looking up at the stars and seeing how far away they are. It's not the awe of the power of the hurricane, but the overwhelming distance, the smallness of man. It transports us out of ourselves, fix that essence. So number three is, fix on it, what happens? You've all remembered some experience, right? Now what happens? What is the essence of that experience? Can anybody explain? In the first examples you gave it, it's more like the bigness it's uh, overwhelming power, beauty, harmony. This makes us insignificant. The smallness of man in the power of an earthquake, shaking. The smallness of our concepts of beauty. All of a sudden, a window opens and we see the beauty of a, of a tree, of a flower, of a babbling brook, a piece of music. How small we are, how little we we see. Step number four is to realize that it's a pleasurable feeling and it's a transcendental pleasure. It's a pleasure that we're not that much in contact with. It's pleasurable. It constricts our heart. We're, we're transported. For a moment, we're a bit paralyzed, but it's a pleasurable feeling. It's wow. But the next step, number five, is to understand why is it pleasurable? What's the pleasure? And the pleasure is 
It's the pleasure of beauty, good, but we have that pleasure all the time. The pleasure of seeing power, but we have that pleasure all the time. Every time you see um, a locomotive, you see power. Every time you see the ocean, you see power. Every time you see a flower, you see beauty. Every time you hear music, you see beauty. But this is the same pleasure, but here it's different. It transports you, it transcends you. Yeah, what is it? All of a sudden you see the pleasure in different confirmation. It transcends your living experience. I think it's the, the very word ecstasy is being beside the Beside yourself. yourself. Outside of yourself. You're in a different world. The world has been transported. Now what does that mean you're outside of yourself? What are you into? You're outside of your petty occupation, your petty concepts of beauty, your petty looking at a flower nice. Yeah. All of a sudden, you're transported into the eternity of beauty, the eternity of power, the eternity of majesty, a different level of existence, the ultimate. You've got to find out how to use it. There it is. We felt it. Don't wait around for the next time that a window is open. Find the window. All right, so that's number six. That find the window means remember these moments, relive these experiences, reseek them. It's difficult, but it can be done. So if you remember the experience, you see what you had, you can do it again. If you understand what happened, if you're just waiting for it to happen again, you can't make it. But you can recapture, you can get that same window all over again, once you've had it. Yeah. Well, we're defining this. He said it's the eternity of beauty and the eternity of majesty. Are those things in and of themselves eternal? <laughs> we perceive them to be eternal. That's what is awesome. When we see the flower in a certain way, we see that the beauty is not, not, it's not, it's not in this world. What do you mean it's not in this world? Where else is it coming from? From eternity. Are they really eternal? They are in and of themselves eternal. They are not eternal, of course not. But the beauty in them is. It's a reflection. The transcendental. Okay, number seven is that first of all, use this, recapture, and use this pleasure and power for living. Now, when you feel it, that day that you were open, you were just staring. You were just experiencing. And in a sense, you were paralyzed. Now, recognizing it, you can say, I was experiencing pleasure. It, it lifted me. It transported me. I was in touch with eternity. Ah, fantastic. But what you've got to learn is that this is energy. You see, the first time you drove a car, you were paralyzed. Yeah? You were paralyzed. You remember when you were, learned how to drive and you took over the wheel and... And then there was a car coming down the other end of the block. And you said, stop talking, you want to get us killed? Yeah, don't you see a car is coming? Yeah. Do you remember that? That's because anything that's new overwhelms us. You know, just, I have to concentrate. How much to the side? How much to, you know, right? The first time you have awe and the second time you have awe, you, you can't function. It's when you live with it, you can feel the energy for living the power that it gives you in dealing with reality. You understand the power you can't, can't be bored when you're awed, right? And you can't be petty when you're awed. Somebody called you an idiot. They don't like you. <laughs> you know? You're in a different world. It's got different, different dimensions. The dimensions are eternal dimensions, not... Me and you and who's who and what's one up and one down. Yeah? There is wonder and pleasure. It's energizing and it's growing. So you got to get used to doing it, reliving these experiences, and you'll know, transport it to living. So when you have an idle moment, when you're on the bus, etc., relive those experiences and then look around you. You're into a different wavelength. You've got to harness that energy. Okay, number eight is, seek these moments everywhere as a constant. 
This is the commandment. We have a commandment, fear God, which includes all. The Almighty is telling us to live with this pleasure. Live with it. So how do you seek it? Well, in our generation, with all the information we got, you understand? it's so easy. You see, this isn't an inert book. This isn't mundane. This is electrons speeding at the speed of light, held together by some weird magical power of gravity that's holding them together to the proton, and all running around at the same time, we can turn the page. We're turning the page of full of power that can destroy Jerusalem. Yeah. Is that right? Well, we overlook it. We <laughs> turn the page, you know. And what's the ink on this page? Just electrons swirling at the speed of light, but fixed <laughs> as they leave the pen to stay adhered to these other electrons. Yeah, A trail of electrons, right? That's what I'm looking at. Mind boggling. And when you wave your hand, what are you doing? All of these electrons moving together because one electron told them to move. <laughs> yeah. And look what man has done. On a tape, you know what's doing there? Goes through here. What, what is it? The, my voice. I'm, it's there. I'll, I'll repeat it how many times? Distributed all over the world. This is a mind-boggling world. You have to pay attention to it. There's nothing mundane about existence. Nothing. At one time, the Chavis al explains in the Shah Prina, he, he explained that one seed can make a forest. And how does it do it? There's a power in it. We know today there's the uh, DNA, <laughs> which replicates itself and which sends out, what is it, seven trillion cells in the body? It's in the sperm cell with the egg cell and the DNA explaining where each one goes, where they have to distribute, what they have to do, how they differentiate into the different organs. Yeah. You're looking at a human being, a mirror, and an awesome. Now, this is without end. How do you talk? What are the sounds? You, do you know beforehand what you're going to say, what you remember from the speech patterns of where the mouth goes? How do I make a T? What, what words? What did I want to think? I planned it, and it came through, and how did it come through? <laughs> Anything you touch. If you pay attention and analyze it and think, what is going on? It's just mind-boggling. Everything is mind-boggling. It, just, uh, it tells us that what we're into is a small <coughs> peanut potential nothing. See everything in the dimension that it really is. Not the mundane nature, but you're used to. All right, number nine is that there's a shorter step to take it, and that is the essence of all of this is the eternal. He who knows that there is a God, a creator of all this, who knows that the hurricane and the flower and the snow and the music are reflections of the creator, focus on being in front of your creator, on the awesome creator who is aware of us. I mean, the Jewish concept of God, that God is a personal God. He's aware of us. He's, we're in his presence. He's paying attention. He's communicating to us. To lose track of that, I mean, that's the way a Jew lives. If he's sane. I mean, there's plenty of Jews who believe in this and who aren't paying attention to this reality. Yeah. The essence of the hurricane, of the beauty, of the ocean, of <laughs> the design of the one who made the electrons and designed them in a way that I can with us is available to us is communicating with us number 10 is the idea is to walk through life with this as a constant a constant keeping your eyes open with toothpicks never bored never mundane never into a simple existence always wondering what is life what are we? What are we doing? It's a different lifestyle. Different power for existence. Different way of dealing with a wife and with children and with partners and with friends. And <laughs> Do, does that make sense? 
You got to get used to it, like everything, like driving. You got to get used to it. Yeah? In five minutes, we can teach you how to use the clutch and the gears, and how to move one gear to second to third. You know. But to master, it takes a little while. Hmm? The same thing goes with all. The first time, it's like a whole effort to try to, to focus yourself into it. But if you keep on doing it, you keep on doing it, then you're living life on a different pattern. And you'll never be bored. You'll never be petty. You'll never give up. You'll never be stupid. You're just out of it. You've grown up. All right, number 11 is that use for living when you feel petty and narrow and small, when you're upset at delays, at your parents, at their knocking you, when you can't deal with the uh, the hassles, huh? put it into gear. Take a walk under the star. And then come back. You're not going to be starry-eyed. You'll just be energized. You say, all right, I'm sorry, Mom. It was a mistake. Finished. You got the eternity with you. What do you have with it? Number 12 is that use as a positive energy. I'm, I'm, number 11 is that when you're down, you're discouraged, you're aggravated, you're hassled, you're fighting with your parents, you got problems, right? Use it to get out. But number 12 is use it as a positive. You're not hassled. You're not discouraged. You're going to study. You're going to get up at back. You're going to play a game of ball. All right, take a walk under the stars, right? Wave that set of electrons, right? And hit it right out of the park. Do you understand? There's energy there too. You're going to work, same way. Without hassles, just to get that energy. It's a means to use your potential. Number 13 is that Jewish consciousness was... The shame Yichud Kutsu Berichud, that before you did something, you would say, Why am I doing this? You would connect yourself to the awesomeness. So by saying it, that's one of the 48 ways, Arichas for saying, you'd remind yourself to put yourself in focus. Whenever you started doing anything. Now we still have this remnant in a prayer book when you put on Tfilin, when you put on Tzitzis, in some prayer books. Some don't have it at all, but some. But it used to be the Jewish consciousness was that whenever you did anything, you went to eat, it said, L'shem yichu kutsu b'richu. You went to work, L'shem yichu kutsu b'richu. You went <laughs> into, into water your garden. You, you, you'd put yourself into juxtaposition. Now, it's a little hard to transport that into a secular world, L'shem yichu kutsu b'richu, yeah? But you should find some catalyst, you know, remember that you always remember to turn on this this aspect of walking with the air. Number 14 is that Jewish consciousness was that the ultimate awe in this world, besides being in the presence of the Almighty, is the fact that we human beings are made in the image of God. We have divine powers. The most profound expression of it is King David's Psalms where he says, when I look up at the heavens and I see the work of your fingers and I think of man and I say, what is man that you remember him? What is all humanity that you you take notice of? And yet you made him just a bit less than God himself. We should be in awe of our own potential of the powers that, that we have, of man's ability to move this whole universe, to encompass it, to understand it, to reach out to the stars, to send hunks of steel flying through the heavens with men in them, comfortable. Walk in awe. Don't, don't, don't underestimate yourself. This was a Jewish person. You're talking to a human being. You're talking to... A bolt of lightning. Yeah, he's quiet now. You don't know. But he can turn the world around. This one here can turn the world on its tail. He can destroy or create the whole world over again. Each one of them. Potential bombs, atom bombs? Nah, nothing. That's what we are dealing with. Treat them with reverence, caution, respect, and awe. Treat yourself the same way. 
Number 16 is that when you, uh, number 15, when you learn the Torah, you learn the, our heritage. So even for a secular man, look what it has done. It's lasted through 3,500 years, impressed the world, still a bestseller, and it still has not been fathomed. It's awesome. What spirit can I say that's one of the proofs that the evidence of Torah from Sinai? But even for the secular man, love your neighbor as a commandment. They think that love is something you fall in love. They aren't aware that you have an obligation to love, and yet they quote us, love your neighbor. Well, you have to get exposure. You have to see it. It's awesome. How can so many years have passed and so many swords have broken and so many pens have been spilled and yet we're still carrying these messages of come let us reason together let us search ourselves let us know ourselves in the world that has put the atom bomb and and has forgotten that man can know himself that there are absolutes to that extent (laughs) what are we the genius of the geniuses you know if you got a message from outer space right you know how you Deal with it, or yeah, try to figure out who's talking, where are they, what are they like, yeah. <laughs> the Almighty Creator of this whole universe, He says, "My child, I love you." What does He mean? He says, "Come, I created you to give you pleasure." Yeah, well, wow, hey, good news today, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm wake up, wow. I mean, touch this Torah with oh. Certainly, if you try to speak to God, prayer, feel the power. You're talking to the Almighty, you know. Stand with awe, fear and awe. Why don't you talk to the Almighty like a buddy and a pal? It's better to talk to him like a buddy and a pal. We are allowed, in Jewish instructions for living, we're allowed to talk to the Almighty as if he's our father, a loving father. You're allowed to. <laughs> Way off base. It's... Mind-boggling that we're allowed to do it. Or, when you do his mitzvahs, if you believe in it, you're making a bracha. Know who you're talking to. Number 16 is that whenever you're studying any aspect of what is living, what is marriage, what is man, what is, what is love, what is good, I want to be good, the definition of good. Whenever you study what life is about, or, because this is the essence of man, the essence of the atom, of the electron. And beyond, it transcends material greatness and beauty, etc. It's man himself. So deal with awe. Now, what does that mean to deal with awe? Look, we studied Talmud, constant study. See the potential. If you're always using your mind and you're always asking yourself, what am I living for and what am I going to do? See the potential. This is an outlet. This is a way to unleash the power. This is where wisdom should always be looked at because it enhances the, the power. You'll, you'll never forget. It. You'll feel the hurricane each time you study wisdom. Number 17 is that for living, we already mentioned that when you're in a rut, blast yourself out. Take a walk under the stars, right? But for living, don't sell yourself short. Always ask yourself, what do I want after a walk in the stars? For career choice, for marriage, for understanding your children, for what do you want out of life? Blast that. Number 18 is unleash it for the constructive part of let's deal with violence, with the hate that human beings have for each other, with prejudice, with a third world war, with pollution. Don't give up, don't throw up your hands. With sanity for all. Yeah? But be aware of the awesome power that is within yourself and within every human being you deal with. And let's get it clicking so that we can really solve man's problems instead of just accepting him and suffering them. Okay, now why? Why do we need this uh, business of war? What what does this do for us? See, what is the strategy? See, number one of, of, of war is that grow up. Grow up. Sense the greatness that is available to us. You see, a child deals with marbles. Go and tell him about success and about uh, about being famous. And, come on, he's playing his marbles, right? But the real grown-up is playing with the full potential of man. 
And in order to do that, in order to blast out of your pettiness, you have to feel the eternal, the infinite. Number two is that sanity. That's the reality. You see, we're, we're, we have a definition in the, in the 20th century. I remember I took a course in abnormal psychology. And you know what insanity was defined at? Abnormal. Somebody who's abnormal is insane. So therefore, if you're living with people who are insane, you're abnormal, so you're the insane person. You get it? Now, insanity, according to our definition, according to the definition of reality, is to be out of touch with reality. The struggle for life in Judaism is a struggle for sanity. We say that a man does not make a mistake, he does not sin. The Hebrew word for sin is mistake, chet. A man does not make a mistake except he is temporarily insane. He breaks with reality. Breaks with reality. What do you mean he steals? He's breaking with reality. He thinks that he's gaining something. No gain. It's an illusion. This is reality, or is reality. There is no mundane world. To walk around in a mundane world is to be crazy. It's to take the dolls seriously. <laughs> you know, hello, good morning, dolly. How are you? If you take it seriously, you're crazy, right? that has got no life. To live in a world where all that it is is a piece of bread and butter, uh, getting a job nine to five, they're nuts. You're taking that, that's the reality. Insane. The Almighty is on the phone. If you don't understand that, you're not in reality. If He's there, you're in the presence of God, you don't feel His presence, you're not into reality. You see that? So you need all to be into the reality. The reality of this world is nothing mundane. We're touching the infinite, we're touching the eternal, we're touching the overwhelming power every moment of our lives. It happens to be God. All right, you've got to get used to that according to where you come from. Number three is that there's a deeper appreciation and that is that is our pleasure. We're seeking the transcendental. Whether we know it or not, every one of us is looking around. We're a little unhappy. We're a little uncomfortable with the mundane. We're looking for something more, for the transcendental. We are secretly, without being aware, we're looking for that experience. We're looking for the, the ascetic experience. You know, it's that moment, that's a moment of recognition. Hey, this is what I'm, I'm living for. This is the pleasure that we're looking for. The rest is, eh, okay, we can get into it. It's a sensation. But there's definitely a letdown. We're looking for more. And when we get that more, we have a different power of existence, a different power for living. It gives us that energy that we're looking for. We are looking for this energy. Just one more, number four, is that we, we, we mention, you see, that it opens us up. It gives us a new perspective. As we say, that the sanity, knowing what your life is, can we... can we take care of a third world war, violence, etc.? Until you're into awe, your perspective is small. You can't see. You know, you don't see the possibilities. You don't see the dimensions that there are in life. Or opens us up. Walk with this way. Walk with your head in the sky, your feet on the ground. So as far as the assignment is concerned, I say try one time. Try one time. And that is, put down on a piece of paper which we say is in Jewish consciousness the whole Jewish people are saying to you the common denominator of free will remember what I say you leave after one day you leave after six months you leave after ten years the work of a human being is to find what is your ultimate pleasure what is your pleasure what are you living for what do you want what are you striving for in life fame success security why what is it Put them all down. Put down to your priority. That's the common denominator. Free will, every human being can do this. A Catholic, a communist, a hot and top, a cannibal. What do you want? I want to get a lot of skulls. Why? Then I'll be a big man. Why, Why do you want to be a big man? Because I'm looking for something bigger. What's bigger? More skulls. Now why are more skulls bigger? <laughs> you know, every, young, every human being could do this. He could interview himself on that issue. So I'm suggesting you put down, take 10 minutes, try to track it down. Yeah? 
Then step number two is plug in a little Lenore and think about the paper, the electrons, that you just left a train of ink, which is electrons, by pressing your hand, which is a bunch of electrons, onto a pen, which is a bunch of electrons, moving it through an impulse, which is an electron, from your brain, which is an electron. This is what you're doing, you know? Get into that ore, yeah? And now ask yourself, what are you living for? What do you want to know? What is your pleasure? And put it down again. See the transformation, see the, the, the shock of pleasure, because that will transform you the rest of your life. I mean, you'll know that ore... I mean, or does something. Try it one time. A 20-minute exercise. And you see the difference in energy, the difference in, in perspective. That's the way to use or for living. And I thank you very much. You have been listening to the 48 Ways to Wisdom 